Welcome to the UNU website and thank you for joining us. Today in Tokyo, we have with us Thant Min Thieu, who is a Burmese uh, historian, scholar, activist, uh, preservationist when it comes to heritage, uh, and um, a man who has returned to his country uh, at a time of transition, who has written about the history of his country in a variety of ways. Uh, a book called The River of Lost Footsteps several years ago had huge international uh, pull. It's a wonderful read. It mixes uh, personal history with wider history. You might think this wouldn't work. It works magnificently in this book. And subsequently, uh, amongst many other books Tant has published, he published a book called um, Where China Meets India, which is about uh, Burma or Myanmar's neighborhood, uh, the two big neighbors, although Myanmar has other neighbors as well, Thailand, Bangladesh, and so on. Um, uh, and that was a wonderful book because it forced us all to think about Myanmar in its own context rather than in terms of our preoccupations with Myanmar. So a great book, very warmly received in the region and internationally. Uh, we're going to talk uh, in a public session a bit later today about uh, the transition uh, an accelerated, really, transition in Myanmar. For so long, uh, perhaps the country itself, but certainly international observers of the country, had felt that it was somehow frozen in time, in a sort of glacial confrontation between forces at play in Myanmar that most of us didn't understand at all well. And then all of a sudden, it seemed, there was an opening up. And I want to start there, Thant, and ask you what you think provoked that opening up. I think in a way, I mean, first of all, thank you very much for having me, David. I think in a way it was that lack of appreciation of the dynamics that were already there, even at a time when it seemed from the outside, especially from the West, that very little was happening inside the country. So I think in a way that image of Myanmar, even before the transition began, as a place that was entirely static where nothing was changing or had changed was wrong. Mm. I think part of the changes go back quite a long ways. I mean, the army in a way since the 1990s and the beginning of the writing of this constitution was looking in a way for uh, a, a method to step back from the day-to-day -day governments of the country. So I think this constitutional framework is something that actually goes back 15 or even, even 20 years. Then you have General Than Shui, who was the autocrat of the country for many years. I think many of us sometimes uh, looked at the situation incorrectly as a junta government yes. implying a collective leadership, where it was really mu very much the rule of one man. Mm. And I think when that one man decided to retire, it was bound to lead to a power vacuum and some sort of shakeup of the political system. But I think more important than anything else was the fact that by 2010, 2011, Everyone in the country, including in the political elite, including in the army, realized how far back the country was falling from the rest of the region economically and in so many other ways. And I think it was that sense of shame at having fallen back so far and a desire to catch up that I think provided the intellectual environment for a lot of the changes we see today. I always wondered at the time whether there might have been a fear even amongst the military uh, <coughs> of falling too much under the economic sway of one country, China, and wanting to open up to others in part, uh, as many countries want to do, to uh, hedge their bets with any particular partner by having other partners. I think that was certainly a factor. I think the imposition of Western sanctions and the boycotts beginning in the 1990s pushed the government in a position that it didn't really want to go, which was an over-dependence on a couple of countries, primarily China, but to some extent a couple of other countries in the region as well, at the expense of a lot of other countries that they wanted to have at least strong economic ties to in the West, in the United States, in the EU, Japan, and other countries. But I think it was just one factor. Yes. Uh, the lack of electricity was another factor. I mean, there were many other yeah. things that, that 
I think made people feel that this wasn't the optimum situation. Mm. There was no reason Myanmar had to be so poor and so far behind and in that particular um, situation that it found itself in. And I think when change began to come, it was almost inevitably going to be in the direction of greater openness, less isolation, some sort of normalization of ties with the rest, rather than, say, towards a, in a more authoritarian uh, yes. direction. Now, you yourself have been a peacekeeper. Uh, you had a uh, long experience in the UN. You served in three peacekeeping missions, uh, including in Cambodia, not too far from home. Uh, you also served, importantly, in the Secretariat on Peace and Security Issues. Uh, Myanmar today has, features a lot of internal tensions. Uh, the Rohingya question attracts the most international attention, but there are other tensions uh, as well. And I wanted to ask you about what seems, sounds sometimes like one peace process, but maybe several peace processes, because I think none of this is very well understood by the rest of us. I think it's, a, it's one of those stories where, because it's so complicated, it doesn't really attract the sort of media attention it deserves. I mean, in a way, it has been a, a success. I mean, Myanmar, I think if you had to categorize the history of Myanmar since independence in 1948 in two words, it would be civil war. Yes. I mean, this is a country which has seen some of the longest standing armed conflicts in the world. There are, by some counts, 18 different armed groups that have been battling the government that are still mm. around, and over 2,000 local militia. Through this peace process, which was launched uh, two and a half years ago, um, the government has managed to sign ceasefires with 18 uh, armed groups uh, and is now negotiating what it calls a nationwide ceasefire agreement. We're perhaps a month away from that agreement being realized and signed. And if it, if it was, it would be a watershed moment in the, in the history of the country. But it would only be a ceasefire agreement. Mm. And it would be at the beginning of a political talks process perhaps leading to constitutional changes, perhaps leading to a federal system of government that would involve not just the belligerents on both sides, but also political parties and, and other political leaders. And this would be an incredibly complicated process. I can't, it's very difficult for me to think of a peace process in recent times that has included so many different sides, as well as so many different neighboring countries and, and others who might be involved. Indeed. Now, uh, the, I'd say the single confrontation that seems to attract the most media attention internationally, it must be more kinetic than the mm. others, has to do with Muslim populations mm. close to the Bangladesh mm. border uh, and a sense of uh, rejection of them by uh, Buddhist uh, groups led by a rather bellicose uh, Buddhist monk. And of course, that's counterintuitive to those of us from the rest of the world because we always think of Buddhists as peaceful and prophets mm. of peace. Could you tell us a bit about that situation? I think in a way there are two, perhaps three different strands at work, um, not entirely connected, but not entirely the same. The first is what you mentioned before, the situation in the Western Rakhine state with a long-standing uh, Muslim minority there, as well as another minority, the Buddhist Rakhine minority. Yes. And it's always difficult when you have two <laughs> minorities, and, and, and again, the situation becomes too complicated to explain very easily. But there's a history of violence between these two communities that go back at least to the Second World War, uh, where they were armed by both sides of, of, of the conflict at the time, by the Allies and, and by the Japanese. A uh, history of, of insurgency in that area. And really, I wouldn't say ancient ethnic hatreds, but long-standing ethnic it's a long-standing ethnic conflict that goes back now a couple of generations. There's a perception on one side uh, that this situation has been fueled in part by illegal immigration from Bangladesh, something that's rejected by the leadership of, of the Muslim communities there. But that is quite different from the sporadic communal violence between Buddhists and Muslims that we've seen in the center of the country, uh, where I think there is at least the possibility of political manipulation involved of local uh, political people trying to gain from these bouts of communal violence, where there is certainly a history of prejudice, but certainly a, also a long history of these communities getting together very well, and friendship on both sides, and, and many reasons to be optimistic that if it wasn't for any further political manipulation, that we wouldn't see that kind of communal violence in the future. 
The third are the Buddhist monks and others who come from really a very long tradition of feeling that Buddhism is under threat uh, and that Buddhism is something that needs to be protected. Uh, and this is something that is unique. It's not unique to Myanmar. It's also a line of thinking one finds in, in Ceylon, in Sri Lanka. Yes, indeed. And it's, it's not uh, a coincidence that Myanmar Buddhism and Sinhalese Buddhism um, have been very closely tied for centuries now. So that is a separate sort of intellectual trend uh, that again perhaps feeds into the way people think about the other two conflicts, but again is, is, is somewhat separate as well. Well, you make clear that the vision that most of us had of uh, Myanmar's uh, struggle, essentially what we saw was Aung San Suu Kyi, brave, heroic, democratic, opposing Ajanta, as you were saying earlier, Whereas, in fact, while all of that was true, there was a great deal else that was true that we knew nothing about. Mm -hmm. Hence the importance of your books, which bring out a lot of this, and also of situating Myanmar in its neighborhood and in Burmese history. Mm -hmm. uh, so the historian in you, and you have a PhD from Cambridge in history, you've taught history there, uh, the historical dimension is so important, and I think journalism rarely makes much place for history because it's complicated. Yeah. So uh, thank you for bringing that out with us. Finally, uh, for our viewers, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, in one of your, your jobs in Yangon, you're very passionate about preserving the heritage of the city of, which was known <coughs> as Rangoon, today Yangon extremely difficult to do, and yet you're working very hard to do it. Could you tell us in a few words about the challenge and why you are devoting yourself to it, heart and soul? I mean, it began almost as, a, as an aesthetic thing. I didn't want to see these beautiful old buildings, hundreds of whom remain in downtown Yangon, destroyed. I as of, they've been in so in many, so many Asian others. cities. And that would be the default thing, especially if we see economic growth now in the years to come. And I felt we were at a tipping point in, in that way. So I simply wanted to preserve these buildings. But this process or this involvement has now taken me in, in two very different directions. One is I realized quite early on that one cannot even begin to think about saving these buildings outside of an urban planning framework. And I'm not an urban planner by background. Uh, and there is no urban planning or there hasn't been any urban planning in Myanmar. So it took me in the direction of thinking about urban, much broader urban planning issues, whether it's housing or transport, or the land, uh, the use of urban land, um, and trying to help or work with the government in thinking about the urban planning challenges that Yangon is a city of five million, which could grow to 10 million in the coming years, will almost certainly face. Uh, but it also took me in a completely different direction, which was to try to use this project to get people to appreciate uh, that Yangon was a great cosmopolitan city and that being a multi-ethnic, multi-faith, multicultural city is actually a great asset mm. and something that they should be proud of and recognize. And related to that, to try to recover so much of the history that's been lost because of the way in which education or people have been taught under the military regime and to recover this uh, very different past of Yangon uh, as perhaps, if not a guide, uh, then at least um, something to think about in uh, looking at options for the future as well. Well, I'm thrilled you're doing it because I have seen so much heritage all over Asia and indeed the rest of the world plowed under. And having visited uh, Rangoon a number of years ago, I remember thinking what an extraordinarily charming city it was, beautiful on the river, a lot of greenery, low slung, and increasingly cities are not low slung. No. Uh, so um, I wish you well with it. It's a tough battle because you have opposing you all sorts of economic interests. Uh, but I think you must have a lot of support also locally. So for our viewers, uh, uh, a bit of a taste of uh, Than who normally can be found in Yangon. I hope some of you will be drawn to supporting his work on heritage there. Uh, supporting other development uh, efforts in Myanmar. This really is both its hour of opportunity and its hour of need, which makes it exceptionally exciting because it has opened up and so much is possible now that was not possible before. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you for very being much, David. With us. Absolutely. Thank you. Great.